Hi everyone, Simon from Hormuz Studio. After explaining quite thoroughly why the rule of thirds sucks in a uh, previous video, some people were kind of left uh, thinking like, but are like all the grid systems that bad or is there like some of them that we can actually use? So while I still think that uh, all grid systems are kind of like really secondary and you don't need to use them necessarily in order to make good images because it relies on many other factors, there are still like a couple of things that we can uh, expect from grid systems. And the one that I want to uh, like present to you today is one that we call dynamic symmetry. So here, like most people, I think will be thinking like dynamic what? Because it's, uh, it's very fun because it's actually something that we very rarely hear about. We're more like used to hearing about the rule of thirds, like um, golden ratio and all that stuff. Dynamic symmetry is actually a way more interesting and flexible system. And uh, basically today I want to sort of show you how we can use it. That's the thing is like, I won't go in depth on like what it is because it's actually very straightforward and uh, there are like plenty of um, like material online that you can find for free. One thing though that I want to emphasize in this video is like why it is a better grid system than most of the ones we hear uh, usually. So yeah, let's have a look at Dynamics Venture today. So dynamic symmetry is based on uh, several uh, little things to understand. The first one is that it's based on specific rectangles. It's not like a grid that you can slap on any type of rectangle. It has to be used on specific types of rectangle for it to be actually working. So what it does is basically you always need to work from a uh, sorry just to work from a square, and from that square you can do different types of things. The first thing you can do is to build a phi rectangle, which is going to be built by actually repeating the diag like mid diagonal or whatever that's called. And you get this sort of re specific rectangle, which is another word for the golden rectangle. But well, the ones you're going to use the most are actually called root rectangles. The first, uh, this one is actually, so the idea is that you have the diagonal and you just pull it downward and you have something that is called the root rectangle of the number of times you've done it. So this is like the second time you do it. So this is a root two rectangle. If you do it like another time, this is the root three rectangle. If you do it four times, etc. And you can literally go like uh, as far as you want, actually. So this is one of the few things to understand. The next thing that is important to understand. So this is what I was just saying. is like this sort of base rectangle that you're going to use. The next step is to actually build the line system. So the next step is to look at the construction line, or not the construction line, but the actual grid system. And here, what is interesting is to have a look at the difference between those two elements here. If you look at this one and at this one, is there like a sort of type of, um, how would I say, lines that sort of tend to look more harmonious or relate more to the actual rectangle that they're in? One thing that is interesting is that usually people will tend to think that this one is actually uh, a bit more interesting than this one that looks a little bit more random. And this is actually the truth in the sense that these are literally random lines, whereas these are constructive lines based on the rectangles that we're working in. So we'll have a look at that right away. If you don't think these look better or more interesting, well, this is, of course, a little bit subjective, but still like based on like what we sort of have in terms of data and whatever is kind of led to think that these are a little bit more interesting and not interesting, but let's say uh, dynamic and related to the actual rectangle that we're working with. This comes from uh, the fact that these lines that we that I just showed you before are actually uh, excerpts or like parts of these lines. And these lines, uh, if I want to sort of explain to you, very quickly how what they are is we have first the two diagonals so these one here the the going up one is called the baroque diagonal and the one going down is called the sinister diagonal i'll explain you a little bit later why it does matter and why it has like a little bit more impact than what we think and the second one is called the reciprocals and the reciprocals are basically perpendicular um, lines that go from one uh, corner to and are perpendicular to the uh, like let's call it nearby uh, diagonal 
And so you end up with this sort of very simple system. So, so far it's pretty easy and you see that you already have some sort of interesting things happening. Next step is what we call major area of divisions. So what is interesting is that by working with these specific rectangles, the fact that they actually retain their ratio means that you can actually have like this is a root three rectangle. And if I sort of squeeze it, but while keeping its ratio and sort of rotate it, I can actually fit it three times in there. And what is interesting is that if I take a root four rectangle, I can do the same thing four times. If I take a root five rectangle, I can put it five times in my thing. If I take a root like 100 rectangle, I can put it 100 times in there. So this is what is interesting with this type of thing, because you can subdivide your um, canvas, basically, uh, however you want. It leads to this sort of like major area of divisions, and which is this way of like, or dynamic symmetry grids, which shows how you can divide your system while keeping ratios. And the sort of like, what's interesting as well that I didn't mention is that basically all these lines if since you rotate them by 90 degrees means they're all going to be uh, parallel. So you have this sort of grid and subgrid that you're creating and you can really do it like almost infinitely if you want. And basically it's like this main idea of like how you can start using diagonals and reciprocals in order to build a sort of system uh, or armature in order to start building things for your image. As I said, I'm not going to go in depth on or like more in depth on how to build these, like literally these principles, you just apply them with actual proper root rectangle and you'll end up with a grid. So there's nothing really tricky about it. What I wanted to focus on more in this video is actually what is interesting about dynamic symmetry compared with other grid lines. So basically what I want to do is give you sort of like five reasons why dynamic symmetry is actually the best grid system out of all the grid systems that we can use. So the first reason I think is pretty simple and it's sort of like what I explained and what you can sort of like understand from the way I explained it, I hope, is that what is uh, fundamental in the concept is that the geometry from the actual grid that you're using stems from the rectangle itself. It's not like this sort of like very arbitrary um, like grid system of like the rule of thirds that you just uh, completely squeeze and like slap onto any rectangle in any canvas. Here the idea is that um, the actual uh, lines that you're using have a sense and make sense geometrically speaking with the rectangle that you're using. And this will help in actually having different types of uh, like dynamism and uh, like composition strength. But this is like stuff that you will learn by actually having a deeper look at dynamic symmetry. The second point that I like is that it actually informs uh, the overall feel of your image. In the uh, previous video, I talked about like why, why flipping your canvas is actually not something so um, random and uh, something that doesn't have like, that much impact. Uh, as I was saying, there was like this uh, art historian, uh, Ernest Gomb Rich, that explained why um, there is a way you feel an image. And basically this is actually why in the dynamic symmetry system, we call the going one, the, the diagonal going up the Baroque diagonal and the one going down the sinister diagonal because sinister is this, this idea that it's something negative. And actually this is something that you feel quite a lot when you're looking at an image is that when diagonals are going downward, there's something a little bit more negative about the way you feel them. Of course, this is a little bit dependent on the kind of message that you're having, etc. But there's still like, you're not going to completely going to shift an image that has like a very nice blue sky and everything is like very um, like uplifting, etc. If you just have like one diagonal going down, but it's interesting to know that in a sort of classical system, if you want something to be felt as quite negative, you have like, it's going to help to use this sort of like downward goings or sinister diagonals. And this might actually help because if your image is not strong enough, uh, in the sense that you're uh, merging too many systems at the same time and too many, like, um, how can I call it? Like contradictory uh, messages. It can help to understand that actually this type of diagonals have this type of perception so that maybe you can fix your image if you can fix this type of diagonal, of course. Another aspect that I really like about the dynamic symmetry is that it can inform the ratio of your images. 
it's something that people tend to uh, not know, but like historically speaking, it was very interesting to know that the um, like artists tend to have like a sort of sketch of their image, and then they would start to cut the ratio of their frame way later in the composition rather than at the very beginning. So what it tells us is that this idea that you can actually start sketching your image and then sort of see what type of ratio of like rectangle ratio you can use and sort of like fits the, um, the image that you want to make. So basically you would have like a base composition and you would sort of like uh, organize and see what type of root rectangle would work and what type of like diagonals would sort of fit the composition that you're working with, which is kind of a interesting thing to think about because it's the other way around with the like the rule of thirds for instance where you just like already have something that's a bit random and you just add the grid on it and you're like i'm not even sure it's going to help or not another aspect that i really like about the dynamic symmetry is the fact that it's very flexible some will say it's actually too much flexible to the point that it actually doesn't have sense or doesn't make sense the thing is or that you have to understand is so first it's flexible because as you've seen with the type of like the system of the major area of divisions you can sort of like rotate and play around with the, um, the rectangles and the, the, the grid that you're using and sort of subdivide it almost infinitely. So this will lead people to think that actually if you subdivide it, um, how is it actually useful if it's like so small? The thing is that is interesting to understand is that basically the larger you use uh, the sort of um, like elements, like if you use the base rectangle or like let's say the first um, subdivision this means that you have like a stronger uh relation with the um, the actual rectangle because you're using stronger lines and longer lines etc whereas if you start dividing it a lot of course you're going to use like tiny lines which means they're going to still relate to the actual rectangle but it's going to be so subtle that it actually doesn't have much impact on your composition so just this idea of like really understanding what are the main lines and how you can actually follow them or like um yeah, using them basically. And one thing that I also like, uh, which is not really entirely um, specific to the, the dynamic symmetry, but still that I find interesting is that this idea of like, you can use it very freely in the sense that you don't have to be like completely subservient to this grid. You can sort of like use it at the end, you can use it at the very beginning, you can use it to fine tune elements in your image. You can do like a whole composition and sort of like see if it fits a grid and then sort of adjust things to sort of make it a little bit more uh, unified, etc. There's like millions of ways of using it, uh, which is I think quite interesting because the whole point I think and the whole issue that I have with grid systems is that they really became um, over time a sort of cage of like how we are supposed to use elements in an image, whereas that actually isn't the way they were intended to. If you look at the work of uh, um, like Bulo or whoever like writers that sort of had like a better or deeper understanding of like frameworks and um, structure in general in paintings, for instance, or photography, they were all used as sort of like very rough guidelines that were not supposed to be used as a very strict system to abide to. So that's it for the video. Uh, it's a little bit rough. I'm sorry about it. I kind of had to go a little bit straightforward. Still, I hope you kind of like understand the mechanism of like the base idea of dynamic symmetry and also that this little points that I uh, expose will sort of give you a rough idea of why this is a better system. One thing that I want to uh, explain and sort of like say as a sort of conclusion in why I think it overall is a better system is that I think it has a better philosophy behind it. One of the main issue I had with the concept of the rule of thirds mainly is this idea that as soon as you've put your little grid on your canvas, you identify four intersection, uh, intersection points and these are where you're supposed to put elements of interest in your image. And while there are like other ways of understanding um, <clears throat> the rule of thirds, this is kind of like one of the stupidest system because what it means is that as soon as you place, it's basically a system of where to place elements, which is kind of not what grid systems are. Grid systems are usually more about like this idea of ratios and dynamics and like not about like actually placing an element. And while there are ways of understanding the rule of thirds differently, 90% of the blog posts and books you'll see will always be about this very 
uh, limited understanding of like, you have intersection points, place your subject there, suddenly your image is magically amazing, which is never the case. There are like many other aspects that you need to take into account in order to make good images. One thing that I like with the dynamic symmetry system, as I said, is that it has a better philosophy because what it does is that it explains that things are all interrelated. Uh, this is one of the things I explain in my course. Once you understand how things are related to each other, you can actually start making more informed decisions by thinking that by only applying like a one third ratio, everything is going to work amazingly well is not true. So what is interesting with dynamic symmetry is that first explains that the uh, dynamic line inside your image will be related to the actual canvas, which is something that is actually interesting to understand. And also the one thing that I think is fundamental in terms of philosophy and like mindset is to understand that the grid system is not a grid to place elements. It's a grid to understand the dynamic in your image, which is a completely different way of understanding the grid. You're not like making intersection points to place elements. You're understanding dynamics and vectors and tensions in order to align objects according to this type of element. So this is a completely different way of actually tackling the uh, building of your image, basically. And what is interesting is that when you look at a grid system of dynamic symmetry, there's no uh, like specific points where you're supposed to place your subject. And this, I think, is very important because there's been this sort of like very big misconception of if I make an image, my subject has to be in a specific location. No, like if you make an image, you can place your subject wherever the hell you want in your canvas. It just means that it's creating specific tension and that if you want to um, change those tension, you have to add elements around that element, that subject in order to sort of compensate. That's the only thing that is happening. People tend to default to the third because it's a very easy ratio to work with, but there are like many other ratios that work and many other ways of placing your elements in your image that will still make very uh, like successful images. And this, I think, once you sort of focus on how dynamic symmetry works, will help you in understanding these fundamentals. But again, this is really, if you feel like you need constraints in terms of like, and having a proper grid system to rely on when you build your images, but this is not a necessary thing in order to make good images. You can make very good images without any grid system or any like apparent one or any, let's call it like conscious one, because you'll always be following some kind of grids. But uh, so if you really want it, dynamic symmetry, I think is the way to go. But otherwise, you can also just try to understand a little bit deeper how tensions work. What are like the principles of perceptions and the like fundamentals of like, as I mentioned in one of the you know, Gestalt theory and all that stuff. And then you'll have like a better understanding of how to make an image in a more informed way without being too stuck to following any type of grid. So yeah, I hope this helped and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.